All right. All right. We're here. We're ready to go. We have uh, Nicholas Cole is here with us today. And Nick, I would say that of all the guests that we've had uh, since the beginning, you've probably contributed the most notes to the doc. That Without we, a doubt. So thank God, because uh, it makes it makes our lives so much easier because we want to talk about stuff that we want to talk about, but we want to talk about stuff more importantly that you want to talk about. So that really helps us a great deal. So thank you for that. Um, we're short John today. Nicole is here. Duncan is here. Duncan, how are you feeling? Feeling good. Everything's good. You're running the show by yourself? Yeah, yeah. It's a little stressful, but yeah. I think you'll be okay. Yeah. All right. We got it. All right, Nicole, how are you? Good? You can give me a nod. And I know you don't have a microphone. All right, let me give let me give you a proper intro, Nick. So you have been on Wall Street for 30 years, right? Give or take? Yeah, 31, 32 now. 31, yeah. 32 years. Okay. And we were just talking about this. You have worked in a whole range of different disciplines and and professions on the street, uh, M&A, IPO deals in the audio, auto industry. You were a senior equity analyst at First Boston, which we know now is Credit Suisse. You were an analyst. You were portfolio manager at SAC Capital, uh, reporting directly to Steve Cohen. Yep. Okay. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. You were a chief market strategist, and now you are director of research at uh, DataTrek, which I have said frequently, publicly, I think is one of the best research publications out there. How long ago did you start DataTrek? Four and a half years ago with my partner, Jessica Raid. Okay, you guys are you guys are I think among the top tier of people putting out your daily research. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, daily. Yeah, for sure. And it's hedge funds, it's asset managers, it's RIAs, but then you told me it's CEOs, it's individual investors. I think you do a really good job at making in information interesting and making it relevant to like a really wide group of people, which is what the whole thing's all about, right? Yeah, absolutely. No, we try to stage out all the content, it's three sections a day on markets, data, and disruption, and try to make it both understandable, but also interpretable into making money across a very wide array of different skill sets and people with different experiences. Okay, and you are a lifelong New Yorker, unlike me, who was a temporary New Yorker and now bridge and tunnel. Uh, what neighborhood did you grow up in? Uh, Upper West Side, 103rd and West End Avenue. From yeah, from the word go through 18, went to undergrad around Philadelphia, Haverford College, came back to New York, worked here for three years, went to Chicago for B school, and came back, and I've been here ever since. All right, and uh, are we making a comeback or what? What's the story? You know, a slow grinding comeback. Yeah, city's going to be different. Yeah, it's, it's not going to it's Although, not going to be the same, but it could be good. Did you notice our train station parking lot is getting is was fuller yesterday than it's ever been? Yes. Like I, I had to park that. on the other side of Hewlett. Yeah, the people are coming back, but they're just not going to come back every day. That's right, and that's just what it's going to be. Yeah, I don't think. But ever. they are coming back. Yeah, office occupancy, according to Castle Systems, is running about thirty-eight percent in the Oof. city right now. So it's still quite low. Bru it's brutal. If you're trying to sell lunch to to office workers, you can't, especially right. midtown. All right, yeah. So, so what happens then? So what's what is the comeback? You know, the comeback is around. I think the entertainment that the city has Broadway. to offer. Broadway, Night restaurants, clubs, dining. Restaurant, I mean, yeah. weekend traffic is pretty much back to normal. It's the weekday traffic that's still quite weak. People will buy apartments here and live here, but they won't be going into the office as much as they used to. It's no longer a five-day-a-week thing. Now, the one exception I would say is when we get the next recession. And that's what I'm kind of thinking about in terms of when does office occupancy actually rise again? Because right now the worker has all the power, both in wage negotiations and how and where they work. That always changes in a recession. So you get a recession 6, 12, 18 months out, and employers get the power back to some degree. It's so, I'm so glad you said that. It's so funny. When you hear like um, Goldman Sachs wants their people back, Morgan Stanley wants their people back, even those people could be like, you know what, I'm going to Silicon Valley. Or I'm going to hedge fund. I'm going to buy side. I'm I'm not gonna. I'm not doing that anymore. In a recession, it's like everybody sings for their supper again. Yeah. It's like the boss wants you there. You show up there. Yeah. Right. Yep. Like that's. I I think that's a really big part of it. Um. So what do they do with all these office buildings in Midtown? Hudson Yards will be fine. Uh, Fight Eye will be fine. But what what do we do here? That is the biggest struggle. And actually, this is better than up where, near where I live, like on Park and Madison. Park between 42nd and 59th is still extremely quiet. Because those guys are sitting in Connecticut. They're not coming back. Yeah. Well, okay. they won't, won't come back until there's a 10% round of layoffs. Can we, do, can we convert these to uh, condos? 
It's too much, right? Over time, yes. Like I used to work down at One Wall Street, that building right in the corner of- Those of, are all condos now. Exactly. That yeah. was the original Bank of New York building, and it's now a condo. And those make more sense as condos because they have like water views. Water views and relatively low ceilings and no, no ability to have a, a raised floor if you want that for technology. So okay. it is a much better residential kind of setup. Okay, but that might not be, we don't need as much in Midtown. People don't want to live here. No, no. Right, okay. You know next door, the Bryant Park Hotel? Yep. That's going to be condos, luxury condos now. Won't be a hotel anymore. I guess I guess that's something that started during the pandemic. I, I wonder what you think of like the hotel situation. That's a pretty ideal setup because you have no possibility of having an obstructed view coming out of the north side of that building because it faces onto Bryant Park and Bryant Park will always be there. Yeah. So it's an ideal thing if you want to buy property because you know you'll always have that sunlight in that view. Right. But no park, one's going to put a building park in front in of it. Park in the 50s, that's never going to be residential. Well, park for north of 59th is residential. Yeah. So just let it creep yeah. down five yeah, blocks. Maybe. Don't yeah. say never. I learned something. We'll, we'll get on to the real show in a second. I learned something interesting. You know the building on 6th Avenue, the Hippodrome? Yeah. Okay. Do you know why it's called that? Yeah. Because, you do. Yeah. Nobody else on Wait, that. No, why? 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 You definitely do. <laughs> Because there the building, were not hippos there. No, the building that used to be there was named for the original horse race track, Hippodrome horse race track. Yeah. I think from, and I don't think it was designed to be a horse racing track, but it was an homage to the original Roman building. Bryant Park, before it was here, was like a lake. Oh. It was like a reservoir. And the Hippodrome, which is a couple of blocks south, was actually a horse track. Really? Not horse racing like we have today with thoroughbreds, but like almost like um almost like a circus, like horses racing camels and llama races and like we did, like rodeos, wild west guys would come and do wild west like uh buffalo bill shit in like on 6th Avenue. Wow, so it really was for it horses. It really really was hippo is uh, is that Latin or Greek? Greek for horse. Yeah. Drome track. It was literally, we had a giant horse horse race facility outdoors uh, on 6th Avenue. Well, not, which, to, not to pound on this point, but just yeah. drive back to the markets. There used to be something called the New York Horse Exchange, set up in 1909, 1910 by J.P. Morgan. And it was the Winter Garden Theater. Oh, wow. So the Winter Garden Theater was the original New York Horse Exchange. And five years later, it shut down because no one collected horses anymore. Right, because cars came along. So anyway, I think the moral of the story is never say never. And never count out New Yorkers' ability to find something to do uh, with with uh, with the space that we have. All right, we're gonna start. We're gonna start the actual show. Um, this maybe got a little bit too New York centric. Uh, what are we doing with right, Gina let, Martin Adams? So let's start with with something that she tweeted. I thought was inter interesting. She said, "Retail sentiment towards equities is now worse than any point since 2009." And what she's measuring is the AAII bull minus bear index, which is below where it was in March 2020, yeah, which we is this year. which is pretty wild. So she juxtaposes that against. Uh, institutions, which meanwhile are buying the dip. So I think what we have going on with the individuals are a few things. One, individuals are, as we've seen, particularly sensitive to the inflation that just won't stop. And also, a lot of these people ostensibly are picking individual stocks and the individual stocks that they've picking have gotten absolutely mangled. I think that's a good point. Like what, why would retail sentiment get this pitch black we're barely in a, we're not even in a bear market for the S&P. It has to be a, a function to some extent of the stocks they're buying. So the stocks they're owning, they're not in a bear market. They're in like the dot-com bust. Yeah, that's right. So look, if you if you overlay ARKK on the NASDAQ from 2000, March 2000 for the NASDAQ, ARKK, Feb of last year, the two charts are exactly the same. Like to within a couple of hundred basis points at any given point over the last 15, 16 months. So there is that kind of blow up going on. But I would say that keep in mind that money flows, mutual fund money flows have been positive into equities this year. The flows have been out of bonds, into stocks, and into commodities like gold. And the flows have been net positive. And it's basically been a swap. People aren't adding anything to their 401ks on a net basis. They're selling their bonds, they're buying stock, and they're buying gold. And that's the trade. It's not a net add, but they are cycling into Isn't stocks. Isn't that rational? But wait, but how weird is this? Because we were saying that rising rates were initially the impetus for stocks to fall. But now rates are rising so much that people are like, all right, F it. I got to sell my bonds. And what do you do when you sell your bonds? We were joking around stocks. about that, but I think but that's, that's – you have to do one or the other and we, in, a, in a retirement account. We haven't yep. seen outflows out of bond funds in like ever – 
I, I want to say ever, and I've been looking at this data for 20 years, and I cannot recall this steady a drip of outflows. There was a massive flush in March of, uh, of 2000, like $340 billion out of fixed income because people just panicked. Hey, wait a minute. Can I, can I say, Josh, that maybe we were like 100% wrong on this? Because my suspicion was that there was going to be sort of a cap on how high rates can go because there's so much money that is desperate for a 10-year at 2%. And it looks like We're actually, half now. <laughs> actually, I might have been exactly wrong. Yeah, the flows say we continue to have higher yields, but this is like one of the cardinal rules of Wall Street: money has to go somewhere. Right. It doesn't evaporate. Right. It'll evaporate like an eighty-seven. It evaporated, but aside from that, it goes somewhere, and it is going out of bonds and into stocks. And if you look at the weekly flows from the ICI, you see that it goes in on big dips. Though that's the dip buying. So we've never had outflows from bonds. But we've also never had a 30-year at 2.4% yield with inflation at 8. Mm. So that so if you're going to ask in what environment would we have outflows from bond funds, this would be it. Yes. Good point. Pretty much the only thing you could think of. Yes. Short of maybe the Treasury, you know, saying that they're not going to make payments. This would be the only other thing uh, that could happen. Um, you were talking about some behavioral stuff that you threw in the doc I wanted to get into. Uh, so working for Steve Cohen at SAC, we talked about that just before and meeting with the house shrink. How often did you actually have to do that? And what do you think that did to either help you or what did you learn from that? Yeah. So just to, just to set this up, the way everything worked at SAC was you were given a pool of money and your job was to make- what year, Sorry, what years were you there? 99 to 01. Okay. Good, so good years to be there. Good years to learn. Yeah. yeah. So your job was basically you got X dollars. Here's your pad. Make absolute returns. You can be long. You can be short. You can trade options. Whatever you want, but you got to show a profit. And the ideal situation was a profit every single day. And the way they taught you was, okay, here's your initial pool of money. Call it $10 million. Your job is to make $1,000 a day. Just like Buffett. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, they viewed it as a craft, not a skill. Yeah. Trading is a craft. And so your job was to make a thousand bucks a day. You do that for two weeks. Okay, now set your goal. What at do you mean 2, by 000. that? A craft versus a skill. Like investing is a skill. Profiting every day a little bit is like industry almost. It's a craft. It's like cooking. Okay. Mm. It's like cooking. Like your right? output is here's the thousand dollars I made today. Yes. Okay. And if you made it at nine fifty five, you shut down your pad and you work on the next day's trades. Okay. If you had three things up and two things down, and those two things down were threatening your thousand dollar a day, you sold them that second. Oh the overarching discipline was make your thousand dollars a day. Once you got to that for two weeks, cool, make two thousand dollars. It's a pretty day. laid back environment. <laughs> you know, it was. It, I had been I had been on Wall Street for over a decade when I sat there for the first time, and it was three linear feet of space, kind of like where I'm sitting right now. Four screens and Steve about fourteen well, why feet did away. You, how did you get in there, and why did you want to go? I covered the auto industry, which is a fantastic training ground for understanding macro not macroeconomics and financial analysis, but it is a horribly structured industry with not very good managements, at least back then. It's better now, but it was horrible back then. This was GM in the 90s, losing market share every year to on promising Toyota, to make it back. Japanese. Yeah. Uh, so after a decade of doing that, it was like enough. And then I had a buddy who was also at First Boston who was going there. He said, come with me. And so we went. It was pretty much that straightforward. And it was just a new challenge, an interesting thing to do. So you got there, you get your, here's your pad, here's your goal, 1000 bucks a day, boom, boom, boom. Okay, now $2,000 a day, boom, boom, boom. And you're by yourself. Yeah, you're sitting you have your in your own PL. Yeah, you're, you're, sitting, team. you're sitting in a room with 40 other guys, but you're all doing the same job. And there's a little screen up in front of everybody's trading pad, a little box of a small CRT screen that shows you how everybody's doing that day. So you can see how you rank versus everybody else. And it's moving? By tick by tick. Oh, my wow. God. <laughs> and everybody can see who's blowing up that day or who's doing well. And you know where you rank. So it's like a, it's like a weird individual team sport. Yes. It's like, it's like Twitter, but with money instead of uh, retweets. Oh, so horrible. horrible. <laughs> Nightmare. So every week you sat down with the house shrink. His name is Ari Kiev. Yeah. And he's written a bunch of books that are, you can't buy them on Amazon, but they're on eBay. And... He was a sports psychologist that Steve had hired to help traders understand how to trade better. And we began every session with, okay, tell me about all the things you did last week. Okay, what'd you buy? Okay, I bought 10,000 GM at a quarter. Okay, why? Here's my catalyst. Okay, how did you feel when you started that trade? Like literally, how did your body feel? 
And for years, I thought this was just a typical shrink kind of question, like, oh, how do you feel about like that? Like a throwaway. Yeah. Like, tell us about your childhood. And then I started reading about behavioral psychology more, and I realized that he was leveraging a very well-known concept. And it was really started with something called the Iowa Gambling Test, which is a very simple video game. You got a screen up with four decks of cards, and your job is to just pick from among the four decks of cards. And you get two points for every red card, and you get a point subtracted for every black card. And you walk into the game thinking all four decks are the same, but they're not. Two are better than others, and you can win more points if you're just picking from the two good decks. So they strap you into like a stress measurement, like, you know, galvanic skin measurement. And they see that the subjects, after about 10 rounds, 10 picks, are beginning to feel stress when they hover over a bad deck, but they keep clicking the deck. The bad one. The bad one, because their brain has not yet registered and accepted the fact that there's two bad decks and two good decks. Only after 40 or 50 rounds does the brain catch up to intuition. Okay. And that's what Ari was trying to get us to understand, is that if you know what you're doing, your intuition is going to work faster than your brain. Oh, so the anxiety would start before the intellectual realization washed over them. This is why I'm anxious about this, because it's a bad deck. Nick, you wrote your body actually tells you what's right and wrong fast, and your brain lets you accept that finding. That is fascinating. Yeah, and that is absolutely true. And it's true in every feature of your life. This is why I think trading is fascinating as a hobby or a career or anything else. It is Trading is like life. If you watch somebody trade for a day, you know more about them than their spouse. Could you substitute the word trading for gambling and have that be equally true? Yes. Okay, it's just the context in which you do it. It is how you manage risk and how quickly you accept that you're wrong. And how you respond. And how no, you but respond. I'm saying gambling, the connotation is I'm, I'm uh, doing something speculative or reckless, investing in trading. It's like, no, I'm wearing a tie. You don't understand. But this I think is different. even at a, at, a but po- same- at a poker table or blackjack uh, craps, whatever, you see how somebody responds to winning and losing, yes. how the, what their attitude is like, if they're impossible to be around when things aren't going well for them, how, like all of that. You learn, yeah. you learn in two seconds. Yes, you do. It's all the same thing. So did you find value in your sessions with uh, Dr. Ari? Yeah, they were tremendously valuable. They were valuable for two reasons. First, to kind of create that positive feedback loop in your psychology so you understand why you do what you do. And it's not just in trading, it's also in every other part of your life. Okay, so what happened after 2001? You just like, okay, I'm glad I did this, but. Yeah, it's a great, it was a great way to make a lot of money, but it was hugely stressful, personally. Like, like not the kind of lifestyle that you wanted to lead for longer than you did. Yes. How do you turn that off when you get home? You don't? Yeah. No, I was trading Japanese auto stocks at two in the morning <laughs> and, and happy to do so. <laughs> so, but he, but he created that. So that's a self-imposed s- stress factory that he obviously enjoys. It's a different breed. <sighs> Yeah, a different breed is sort of, it's a nice understatement. Steve is, first of all, a genius. Yeah. Like, solidly. Like, Batnik level? Or like, (laughs) what are we talking about? Intelligence or like, control of his emotions? All of it. All of it. And that's what's so amazing. Like, everything from little things, like, you know, he'll just have this intuition, like, why is this stock moving? And he'd like, let's stand up. My, my, everybody in the room had a nickname, so I was Wheels because I covered the auto industry. (laughs) Okay. So wheels, why is GM down a point? Okay. And so the way I dealt with that was I just had a discipline of writing down every single catalyst that could affect every stock that I covered. And so I'd walk over my book. It was a physical book, big binder book, and say, okay, here's what's going on. GM CFO is up at Fidelity today, and he had Mexican the night before because this broker took him out. And I happen to know he hates Mexicans. He's so, he's, so he's probably not very happy at these client meetings today, oh and he probably God. is not really talking. That's the level of granularity that was expected, and it worked. It worked fantastically well, but it taught me, okay, stocks move for very particular reasons. There's always a reason. There's always a reason. And you may not know it, but there's a reason. Really? Yeah. You don't think there's any random walk on a day-to-day basis in any ticker? I think the minute you accept that as your paradigm, you begin to lose. So you could have a stock that starts the day down 4%, ends the day up 6%. No actual news hits the tape, but there's something going on that some people know. Yes. Okay, I would buy that. Yes. I would believe that. And your your job at SAC was to know that thing. Hold on, but both things are true because it's better for most people to believe it's random than to think that they can know why, but you guys might know why. Yeah. But what, but so how do you disentangle the way a stock acts intraday from what the overall market is doing. Isn't the answer for Steve sometimes 
somebody big is selling the ETF that the mm -hmm. stock is in. And that's it, just what yes. it is. It was simpler back then because you, this was pre-reg FD, pre-reg AC, pre-reg NMS. You had a very straight up structure. On a New York Stock Exchange stock, you had a specialist and they made the book and they knew what was going on. It's right. much different now. You didn't, And you didn't have the same algorithmic arbing. Now the right answer might just be that, hey, um, Procter & Gamble and Colgate are trading too far apart and there's 15 algos that trade 100-day trailing correlations and they're jamming them together. He doesn't want to hear that shit though. No. Okay. So somebody, he somebody does, is sitting at 0. 0.72 telling him stories still about every stock in the book. No, he'll just hire the algo guys. Okay. Got it. So he's always kept a step ahead by doing that. Yeah, I, I don't want to sound like a huge fanboy, but yeah, he is the most influential. I saw the tattoo, so yeah. it's too late. <laughs> He's the most influential person we'll I've ever worked for. get a shot at that for, for Instagram. Yeah. Is he? Yeah. Okay. Just in terms of like a no excuses approach to thinking about the world. Before we move on from him, what's the one thing most people don't know about Steve Cohen or SAC? Uh, like what's, or what's the thing that people tend to get wrong from the outside looking in, people that have never been there or, or met him? He's very calm. Okay, so he's not throwing his keyboard when a trade doesn't work. No. Or when the feds are kicking the door down. He's very calm. He's like ice. He's like an ice man? He's just process. Yeah. And that's sort of maybe what I took away more than anything is whatever you do, have a process and stick to it. And even if things are going wrong, stick to your process. Is that the kind of people that tend to work out there? Yeah. Same demeanor? Yeah. So they don't have hotheads there? They don't have people that are like passionate about stocks? Oh, they're all passionate, but- Competitive. You can't be emotional. Okay. Like everybody yells. Yeah, Steve yeah. yelled. Every, I yelled. Everybody yelled at something about somebody at sure. some point, just a stress relief. But the process is what's your catalyst? What's your in? What's your out? What's your stop? Okay. And that's, and that's like the way of life there because yeah. you can't survive without stops, without reasons for what you're doing. Yeah. And ultimately it also taught me like that, you know, and I heard this first from another trader, but it always stuck with me. Prices lead fundamentals. Oh, I totally believe that. Not always, but it's a better general rule than not. If you're going to believe one thing. So, okay, I love that. So you have a stock that's that's every day down a half a percent into earnings. Stock gives up like 11% into earnings. Which direction is the surprise more likely to be in? Yeah. I 100% believe that. So there's nothing random about that. That's some people being better informed than others. Yeah, the way I internalize it is a basic rule. You never buy a new low, you never short a new high. Okay, I like that. You writing that stuff down? Ever. Yes? All right. Uh, give me uh, this Ryan Dietrich tweet. Let me give it to you. It's right in front of you. You give it. No, but give it to me on screen so that it's oh, in talking, front of- Oh, talking to Duncan. So that it's in front of Nick. And give it. Give it. Give it, Duncan. This is crazy. The S&P 500 hasn't had an update of less than 1% since February 16. That is nine updates in a row of at least 1% gain or more. The last two times it did this, June 09, April 2020, not the worst times to be bullish. Huh. This is what bottoms look like, I guess. Like relentless 1% updates that don't let you in if you were too bearish. I don't want to believe it. Like just fundamentally, like I don't want to believe that. Well, that you have a bottom, sample but... size of two. No, so. but, yeah, but, 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 <laughs> no, but dude, it matters. Like aggressive buying off of the lows, I think matters. It's, what, do, what do you think about this? So this, this is supposed to be bullish. Well, I think it's supposed to just describe an atmosphere that's rare. Well, here, hold on. Here's another, here's another uh, uh, data point that jives with this. So this is from a guy named Sentiment Trader. He said that the last, there, there's been five times in, in the history of the NASDAQ that we had back-to-back -back daily gains of 2.5% following a 52-week low. Four of those were at bottoms. The fifth was like October 2008. So I guess the point is that after like aggressive buying after a washout is generally pretty bullish. Right. Okay. So on the NASDAQ, I can see that because I just did the trailing 100-day and 200-day returns on value versus growth for the Russell and for the S&P. And it got to two standard deviation extremes on March 14th. Value outperforming. Yeah. Wow. So we are at two sigmas on value versus growth. So I'll buy the NASDAQ trade. I get that. This is harder. Right. Um, this is harder because, yeah, it's a, not a big sample size. And because the downdraft we have to think about is 2000 to 2002, which was a low vol grind that was just soul sucking. And it went on I and on and remember. on. Yeah. And it was, it was nothing like 09 or 08 for that matter, which were much more cataclysmic downs and then backs up on fiscal policy and monetary if policy. If you look at the bear market rallies I've got it. from 2000 to 2002, 
And you think about what stocks were doing during those. Where I remember stocks like JDS Uniphase being up 75 points in a day. Yeah. And you were like, Look at thank this. God. This is one of the fav my favorite charts that I ever made. Nick, I got it right here. So this is 2000 to 2002. Mm -hmm. This is the S&P 500. Right. And these are the percent from, these are all the bounces along the way. Yeah. 12% bounce, 7, 8, 19, 21, and 21. You get faked all, out so many All times. the way on 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 the, on route to a massive, massive right. So do you, know where, do you know where we are today on where, this? Where do you on, think we are? On like an ARKK, which ARKK looks just like the red line. Where do you think we are? Uh, I don't know. Where are we? Right that, right there, right on that dip. Okay. Right, right there yeah. on day count. So the fake out bounce. If We're, this rolls over, it's just going to it's gonna hurt a lot. That That rip was on the Fed cutting rates. And then we ended up with 9-11 and the second Gulf War. Enron, WorldCom. There was like this whole litany yeah. well, I of think we, we bad all, shit. We all agree that if this bounce fails, it's going to get ugly quick. Yeah, because that bounce happened off the of Fed cutting rates. The Fed's not cutting rates. So that's the part that I have a trouble squaring the circle. I have trouble accepting the bounce because the Fed is hiking, obviously. Inflation is not slowing down. Companies were already warning of forward guidance like coming down, which is why they were getting killed in the first place. So there's all of these headwinds. We haven't even begun to digest higher commodity prices with consumers and stocks are bouncing. So, okay, my rationale for this bounce in the last two weeks is uh, one point. Positioning? VIX. Okay. Okay, so the VIX average for 1990 now is 20. Standard deviation is eight, okay? So 28, 36, 44, and 52 are two, one, two, three, and four standard deviations. The second standard deviation, the 36th level, is super significant. What was the VIX close on March 8th? North of 30. 36 and a half. I didn't realize that the VIX has come down like this. Yeah. That's, yeah. We've gone that's up what's happened. Eight days out of nine, we've been rallying. Yeah, right. I guess, yeah, because wow. we got dramatically oversold and we hit that two standard deviation level. Like This is like a big part of the work for our clients. Is like, And we probably repeat it too much, but it's like, no. 36 VIX is super significant because if you don't rally on a 36 VIX hard, something seriously is you wrong. You are screwed. Yeah. So, uh, equity so it's be worth betting that you will. You got to try. You got to take your shot at 36. So, okay, so it worked. It worked. And VIX is uh, nothing mean reverse. Sub 22. Now it's sub 22. It doesn't really mean revert. It oscillates. No, it does mean right? revert. It, re it, it, it literally mean reverts to 20, but and this is a huge but. When it doesn't? There are times, the VIX everybody thinks oscillates like a sine wave. It doesn't. Okay. It goes up and stays up. Like from, 70, from 97 to 03, the VIX was consistently over 20 that entire period of it's time. It's a regime. It's a regime. Yes. And from, oh, I want to say 07 to 13, right, for a whole range of factors, VIX got to 20 and always came back up. And then you have those long periods in between where the VIX can get to 10. 2017. Which, what, which was what we was, just came it was, off. It was 10 the whole time. We had a short bout last summer fall of a 16, 17 VIX. We didn't get to the 10 handles that we used to get. No, no. So, uh, uh, I, th I feel like 16, 17. 2017, yeah. the VIX was 18, like, it was like 10, 19. The 10, 9, yes. 8 the entire yeah. day. I used to work with an options desk at, at the old firm and they were ready to blow their brains out. Do you out remember the articles that Wall Street bonuses would be low this year because not enough volatility? Yeah. And you would say, wait, now they want volatility? I thought they wanted, like, what do people actually want? They want if you, action. If you're, if you're a banker, you don't want volatility. If you're a trader, you want volatility. You need it. Okay. And bankers have higher, higher ROIs than traders. Okay, so now what? So now we've had the VIX collapse once again. Yep. We've had eight out of nine days of just relentless 1%. By the rallies. way, another one today. Another one today. So what is the right way to think about this? Now there has to be follow through, even if it's a slower moving upside. Uh, to me, what I'm telling people is well, the minute the VIX gets to a 2.0 spot handle, sell. Okay. Because that's the VIX collapse and you got the benefit of that already. It's 21.6 right now. Right. So 20 handle, 2.0 handle. That's so today's Thursday. Second. Conceivably, we could have another really good day tomorrow that takes the VIX that low or it needs a little bit more time. It probably needs a little bit more time because we've had this very, you know, big rip and it's been very consistent. So it probably does tread water. This is what makes this market so hard. Because, okay, you know where we're heading in terms of monetary policy. You know where we're heading in terms of inflation. You know what's happening with oil. The Fed is going to slam on the brakes deliberately yes. now. However, if we walk in Monday morning and there's a ceasefire in Russia, Ukraine, S&P's up, S &P's up 5% that day. They'll go limit up. Yeah, I agree. That's why, you can't, that's why you can't get too bearish here because that's the thing that would make everybody all of a sudden say, Well, you say, can get bearish okay. here. You couldn't get too bearish there. Yeah. When everybody was bared up. Right. 
So hypothetically, we get that ceasefire, which forget about the stock market. Obviously, we all want that for the same reasons. Like we want the killing to stop. Then you get the relief rally. But do you get new highs? Because you're still dealing with inflation. But we just got the rally. What if what if we sell on the ceasefire? I mean, I wouldn't bet on that, obviously, but no. like no. You can certainly have a big ass rally and you might get close to new highs for probably not a bad reason. And that is you got S P net margins at twelve percent. Pre pandemic they were nine ten. With the tax cut in seventeen, they were ten and a half. Yeah. And now you're talking twelve. And if you get a good economy with inflation pricing power, you can get to twelve and a half, thirteen percent net margins. With oil and gas prices fading. With oil and gas prices fading and perhaps a better, you know, a better consumer psychology going the back half of the year. And then all of a sudden you're talking about two forty, two fifty on the S P in terms of EPS. And gigantic buybacks. Gigantic buybacks because valuations are not linear with margins, right? You get a certain valuation at a 10% margin, and if you get an 11, 12, 13% margin, your valuations go logarithmic. Shit, I just got bullish. It's all, right? It's all marginal dollars. <laughs> it's, three, it's 340. Go put some go, go put some logs on. Um, I want to talk about this, uh, how to look at historical data and price charts. We debate this all the time. The point that, you, can I quote you? Yeah. To you? Maybe this is too general, but I spent a lot of time thinking about it. The S&P 500, for example, has seen such large changes in sector weightings over the years that looking at prior returns is tricky. It's all we have, but I'm with you on this. Energy was 20% of the index in the 80s. Now it's 4%. CPI in 1974 was 25% food. Food is 13%. Sick, wow. Food inflation was huge in the early 70s, 15%, which is why as much, which, uh, as much why inflation was such a problem as energy price. Some of the same problems now, but just looking at headline data misses some of the stories. So we talk about this all the time. Is this chart related? This is the unemployment chart or no, that's something else. No, that's a pretty clean data series, actually. Okay, so so tell tell us about why this is so important to you. Because I think we're on the same page here. Yeah. So let's take the S P for example. So S P nineteen eighty, after oil prices run for a decade and energy company earnings are huge, is twenty percent of the S P. Yeah. So when you look at a long term chart of the S P or look at S P returns, because like the seven late seventies were fine for the S P. It was down like I think four percent in in eighty, but it was in between two big rallies, and it was because the sec the index was hedged against inflation because it was so oily. Because it was so oily. Right. And it's not the same way now. Why did I say that wrong? Because <laughs> it had so much. Because the oil stocks were so large. It was funny. It was right. oily. So, so a quick story. Like when I was when I used to call on Fidelity all the time, they had a chart room. This was pre-internet. So if you wanted to like show a bunch of charts to PMs, you literally set a and it was a room about three times the size of this room, and it was just every PM's favorite chart, and invariably it was always the most favorite charts were In Boston. Yeah. Okay. I've heard the, of this room. This is the JC's per, told, told us about this. The percentage of the in, of the S and P that is every sector, because the way PMs would trade them is to look at the band of where the weightings were, and then try to pick off tops and bottoms. And energy, even in 2010, was 10 percent of the S and P. I remember. Yeah, that's like three. And now it's just breaking four. Okay. So my bet on energy is just straightforward. Like we need the stuff. We need these companies. They're going to make a lot of money. That is weighting is going to go up. That's probably, I think, to me, in my mind, the easiest trade for the next two years. And they're not going to race into the fields with new drilling projects because they're actually the CEOs are actually enjoying having profits. Yes, all of them, almost like a cabal, like, and also enjoying some social relevance that isn't just on the back of ESG criticism. Well, right now they're a defensive asset. Like having having uh, our own supply of natural gas and oil is like. It's like having your own Air Force. It's like waving America. I love this idea of looking at the historical data with the grain of sand because so much of this change it would be like comparing like John Morant to Bob Cousy. Like they're both playing the same game, but it's completely different. Or another example, just really fast, housing inflation. Okay. So prior to 1983, the CPI measured housing inflation using interest rates. So the higher the interest rates were, the more housing inflation occurred. And that's why you got, and I have the numbers here, CPI peaked at 15% in March 1980. Three points of that was just interest rates going up 30% over the prior year. Because that's a cost. Right. Okay. So what did the BLS do? They changed it to the current owner's equivalent rent calculation in 1983. So you stopped imputing housing prices through interest rates, which is why you haven't seen housing inflation anywhere near as high as the early 80s because it's a totally different calculation. Look at the CPI chart. You wouldn't know that. 
So that's apples to oranges if you're trying to compare this era versus that era. Yeah, apples to bowling balls. It's nuts. Right. So, so what do we do prospectively if we say, okay, I want to incorporate historical data into how I allocate across sectors or my return assumptions if I'm doing financial planning. Like, it's evidence. I don't know how relevant all of the evidence is, but it's better than nothing. Yeah. So what do you do about that? All right. So the number one thing right now is a very basic issue. How much do corporate earnings hedge you against inflation? Let's say that you are going to have a period Versus of Versus stock inflation. prices, corporate Versus, earnings. Right. Okay. Well, are we saying the same thing or no? Tangent, uh, you know, related. Because obviously stock prices can go up on, on the back of lower interest rates with earnings the same. But on the other hand, if you don't have the interest rate story, you really have to have the earnings story. And that's the situation we're in right now. Yeah. There's a lot of work done, and I've done, I've, I think it's largely true that in the 1970s, corporate earnings rose at the same pace of inflation. So owning stocks was a reasonable inflation hedge. Like you held your value from 1970 to 1980 owning the S&P. But now they're outpacing. Earnings are outpacing inflation. So far, yes. And because it's a different set of companies. So what you really have to believe is, okay, are tech companies immune from inflation or do they have inflationary pricing power? Because in, in, like we were saying, in 80, it was energy. Right, oily, oily index. <laughs> but what if this time it's the reshoring and onshoring of like a whole host of cyclical things that we are no longer going to do outside of the United States? And it's all these factories now being built to make chips for the auto industry, for example. And it's like, what if that's the new tailwind for corporate earnings? Those companies could theoretically get bigger in the S&P. I know yeah. they're not that big, yep. the cyclicals. But it, it's a story that's got possibility, right? It does. Okay. It does. The offset is how much more does it cost? What is? But the if you, but, okay, I agree. But who cares about the cost if we're spending it here? You care because let's say a car goes from costing forty grand to fifty grand, just to pick numbers. But all being assembled by American workers, right? Is it? Isn't it a net win? No, because demand for cars might decline. Okay. So it's unsustainable. So it's unsustainable. Actually, Nick, can I ask your opinion as a former auto analyst? What was your what has been your stance on Tesla all these years? Fascinating company. Um, I can back into why it should be worth a lot more than a traditional car company, just off reinvestment rates. So GM and Ford have to reinvest some portion of cash flows back into ICE. Tesla does not. And if we've learned one thing, it's the value of reinvestment rates. And this has been true for the last 10 years. If you as a company have a high reinvestment rate because your thing is the new thing, your valuation is going to be a step function higher than the companies that have to reinvest cash flows and things that are not going to have that same competitive advantage. And they still are investing. And in, even though their, their, their future is electric, yeah. they still have no choice because they have the existing manufacturer. There's still 5,000 powertrain engineers working on internal combustion. Right. How many are there at Tesla? Zero. Right. What else you need to know? That's interesting. So the input cost is as important as like the potential market uh, mar market share debate. To me, it's more just you're reinvesting cash flows in the right way. Like we've seen like with tech stocks, like how much of a crazy valuation you can get if your reinvestment rate is extremely high. If you were advising Mary Barra or Ford, would you tell them spin, spin off the electric already? Give it its own equity. Have there be a legacy GM and then a GME. That's like, well, GME might be taken. <laughs> that ticker. Um, but the old GME, GameStop. the old GME was Ross Perot's EDS letter stock on GM. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Like, would you would you advise them that they should continue what they're doing, which doesn't seem to be working valuation wise, or do something more radical? So here's the thing: they absolutely have to spin them off. And actually, a guy that I used to these work- stocks are, These stocks are horrible, by the way. Yes. Ford and GM. Yes. Right, okay. So they absolutely have to spin them off. There is no doubt about it. They will not spin them off until the next recession when they need the capital. So in that respect, Ford is better positioned because at least they're setting up the dual business structure to be able to accomplish that. I used to work with a guy named Daniel Ammon, who was an analyst, uh, an investment banking analyst at First Boston. He became the CEO of GM Cruise. And he just got fired at the end of last year for pushing too hard for a spinoff. He wanted Cruise to be standalone. Yeah. It would be worth so much more than it's worth well, in, inside of GM right now. The problem is the minute you do that, the valuation of the existing company goes down dramatically. Yeah. The old, you know, old co 
goes down it, dramatically. It's like paying one of those extraordinary dividends, special dividends. Right. Same so thing. So Ford is going about it the right way. They're setting up the dual structure. They're doing all the things they've got to do internal to the company so that if and when you get a recession, you can do a partial spin of the EV company and get the capital. Because the big issue is not so much corporate structure, is how are you going to fund EV for the next decade? Well, Cruise is not EV. It's autonomous. Correct. And they just bought out SoftBank stake this week. Yeah. What does that mean to you? Is that like a very bullish so signal of what they think Cruise is about to do or just cleaning up the books? It feels like cleaning up the books because I think we all know AV is still some ways off. Yeah. Well, you would know better than anyone. Yeah. It's hard. That oh, is we're we're going to talk about that stuff later. Um, what's this chart? It looks like unemployment versus – is this unemployment versus itself or versus – yeah. Put this back uh, – Nicole, put this back up, the Fred chart. So what are we showing? It's just so weird how low the unemployment rate is, given where inflation so is. What, what, what's, what's the takeaway? Let's set this up. What is what is this telling us? Yeah. So this is just a very. This is one of the things we do a lot of, which is look at these rates over multiple cycles to this really is understand. Unemployment. Where we're at. This is like headline just unemployment. Straight up. Right. right. So the point here is just look at where the lows are for the 1970s, 1980s. Like people think of the 80s as a pretty good time in economic history in this country. Unemployment never broke five percent. To the downside. To the downside. Yeah. In the 1980s, you got just there. In the 1990s, that was actually the hottest economy, the late 90s, early 2000s. That I think we ever sustainably What is had. that, 3% at the low? Uh, yeah, early just, 2000? Just, yes. Like and, now. And with the highest participation rates of labor of any time in history. That's But that's related to the age of the average worker. Yes. That's a demography story too. Yes, it is. That's my dad's generation yep. being at their peak earnings years. Yep. Okay. And then the point now is just look at how quickly we've come down. It's wild. And this is a very hot late cycle economy right now. I mean, it's just sort of a simple way of expressing something I think we all know, but in a graphical form where you understand it is really a special time. Last week, there were 189,000 um, unemployment claims, which is the lowest since 1969. Nice. And when the workforce was half how the do you size. Have, right. So, how do you have a recession? With less than sub two hundred thousand, like things would have to get really bad for a long time, in order to cool off the labor market. Or am I wrong? No. Uh, well, are five million open jobs going to disappear in a month? Like it seems very unlikely that we can cool this labor market off without a real recession. And that's exactly the which problem. which is your point. Which is exactly the problem. Okay, is that what you're showing here, or you're just making the point that? No, this was just to put the frame around this very long term track record. Like this is where we're at. And if you think about where we're going to go from here, like what's a recession? It's declining growth. But the, your, the, the point okay, so this is you. Powell says he wants tighter financial conditions. What exactly does that mean? Corporate spreads, mortgage spreads, stock prices, what? Ultimately, he wants to see fewer job openings. Good luck. So wage inflation declines. Um, but can that happen without a recession? Never has before, at least from these levels of inflation. So where does this leave us? Are we rooting for recession to help so that the Fed can do what they're trying to do? It's weird, right? It is weird. To be in this position. Look, on the one hand, your best case scenario is just get the stock market down 15%, have your recession, clean this all up in six months, and then you're off to the races for the next 10 years. Reset. Because, because the Fed has done what they needed to do, and then you can go back to a more normal life. That is not what's happening now. What's happening now is you've got a Fed that is going to be pushing very hard, and they want to see – Investment grade spreads up, high yield spreads up. They want to see mortgage spreads over 10 years up. They want everything to cost more. They want the cost of money to rise so that the aggregate demand declines. They want less bank lending, but they can't yeah. say that because that's like that's off message for the midterms, for example, is to say we're trying to materially impact um, the, you know, the capital markets in a negative way. You can't really say that. No, and this is the, the hard part. Like you said, you have these 5 million job openings. They're not going to go away. So how do you convince corporate America to stop trying to hire every warm body? Robots. Is that where you're going? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, 10, 10 two-year uh, treasury yield spread. Nicole, you got that? This collapsed faster than I thought it would. We're, we're at a flat yield curve. Yeah, it, was, it was steepening like a week ago, it feels like. Got. So what's going on? You know, look, so why do we care about this chart? Yeah. I care about this chart because this is like one of the most closely watched recession indicators on Wall Street. So this is the 10-year minus two-year treasury yield spread. Right. Um, okay. Does this cause the recession or is it the signal that enough people think there's going to be a recession? 
I've heard both. I think it's neither. I think it is a signal that the yield curve is sufficiently brittle that the next bad thing that happens pushes you into recession. Okay. Is it true or have you seen any data that people say banks borrow short, lend long, and so when the curve is inverted, there's no incentive for them to lend. In fact, it's the opposite. They're disincentivized to lend. Is there any data on- And that's what causes the recession. Yeah, and so it's tightening of, of credit. You don't believe that. Is there any data on that or is that just what we say? I think it's intuitively correct. So I think that's fine. But if you go back and look at the history, like- By the way, that was Campbell Harvey calling. So we're, we're gonna, <laughs> we'll, pop, we'll pop him on speaker to refute whatever you, you tell us next. When you look at this chart, right? Okay, so go to 1990. So yield curve is flat. Right. Then Iraq invades Kuwait. Like, boom, there's your geopolitical event. Go to 2000, yield curve goes flat, right? Then you have dot-com and 9-11 and Gulf War II. Then you go into the financial crisis. And every single time, what it's really telling you is the system is brittle. That's the way I interpret it. And we, we, the curve inverted right before the pandemic. Yeah, that's right. The curve caused the pandemic. The curve inverted in the fall of 19, and everyone said myself included, well, let's not be so hasty because X, Y, and Z. Well, would and then have, the pandemic would, was like, LOL, yeah, would they here's ha- your recession. Would there have been a recession absent the pandemic? Who the hell knows? How would we know? Right. It's the same as with oil prices. Like I always look at oil prices, 100% gain year over year in WTI creates a recession or it correlates with a recession. It also correlates with this chart. Really? Yeah. Hmm. What's this uh, US 30-year mortgage rate quarterly change? What are we saying here? Mortgage, uh, mortgages are now four and a half percent average mortgage. That hap- that that escalated quickly, as they say. Yeah. Okay. What are we What are we looking at with this? I mean, the risk here is pretty straightforward. You get a decline in house prices, or the house prices stop going up at the rate they have been for the last year, and you lose a little bit of wealth effect. The offset to rates is wage and wage growth is still quite strong. Employment still pretty is still strong. Crazy. Don't we need how home prices to come down, or at least stop going up? Isn't this like really unhealthy? You know, if you look at the five years prior to 2019, home prices had not been growing very quickly. And if you look at the whole period from 2010 to 2019, the Kagers are slower than most prior historical periods. So it's catch up? There's a little bit of catch up. And what we really need, honestly, is more houses being built because the demand's going to be there. And again, like we keep cycling back to the same endpoint, and that is how do you bring down housing demand? It isn't with rates, it's with fewer people employed and a recession. Again, we're back to the demographics. There's like a lot of household formation and just people that want a house. So if you tell me a story where the mortgage rate knocks the average selling price down five or six percent or ten percent, I probably would say, okay, on balance, good for the economy. This chart is horrible because more people could afford to start their life. Is that the wrong way to think about it? That's what we think about, but you can't exclude um, employment from that calculus. Okay. So if it happens and you get a recession and you get, you know, all those job openings get pulled and then people- the demand will subside either right. way. Okay. Look what at this that? chart from Redfin. The mortgage payment on median asking price is up 25%. I mean, this is nuts. Over what period of time? I'm guessing year, year, I'm over guessing year? year over year. But what this isn't even showing is like, how are people coming up with down payments anymore? Uh, well, now, now you have to borrow even more money anyway. And then how big does the down payment have to be, you're saying? I just think so many people are getting priced out. I mean, not I think, I know. Well, the answer is you're selling a house to buy a house. So you've got capital, you've got, you've got equity. I'm saying, I'm saying new buyers. New buyers are, no. I mean, yeah. you have to rely on one of the, one of the mortgages pulling a 3 or 5% down payment. Right. So home prices were up 20% year over year at their peak. That works in favor of the retiring boomer who yeah. bought their last, sold their last house. And now they're going into a community. They're maybe renting, they're, but they're maybe moving in with a adult child, mm-hmm. but they're not buying the next house. Yeah. If they're you're in, you're good. The, if you're in, game. you're good. If you're in a house, you're good. Right. For people trying to get in one for the first time, it's brutal. Yep. Okay. Bank stocks. What do we think about the financials rally seems to have petered out when the curve steepening stopped and started to flatten. Yeah. Um, so banks don't want rising rates, period. They want rising rates with a steepening curve. Is that the right conclusion to draw from that? Yeah, but I also think it's tied into this whole growth value rotation. Like value just got so overbought 
you know, and banks are all value stocks, and banks are all value stocks. So I, I do like financials, but I think we got way overextended in value generally. So speaking of uh, like correlation, so the we chart, have, the Nicole, chart, we have this. The chart that we're looking at is the KRE, which is regional banks divided by the S and P five hundred, yep. um, with the ten year, and they generally move pretty closely, and they've started to diverge until last yeah. week. Yeah, I think it's more of a value. Where's money going? Just value got overbought. Yeah. I mean, we seem to have hit a turning point in value versus growth in the last week. And you can kind of tell a story about the next move. If we start worrying more about a recession, then where do you cycle to? You cycle back to reliable growth. And if you look at all the big tech, like look at NVIDIA today. Yeah. Like NVIDIA was one of the only two stocks among big tech that had been lagging the S&P. Everything else has been working. I think up 10% today. Holy yeah. shit. That's yeah. NVIDIA. And that's because well, they had the GTC conference. And this is Nick. This is uh, Russell 2000 value divided by growth. So yeah, there's pretty significant pick. pullback. Yep, because it was a two standard deviation move, and that's super significant. Why? So, why is that the level? It just so happens to be where it gets super extended. Yeah, if you look at long term charts of most financial data, and we do this for this kind of analysis for like everything we can, one standard deviation is almost always noise. Two sigmas begins to be like a real signal. And it's not just like, oh, the market magically reverts. Every algo on the street does this math every tick of the day. I remember you were doing a lot of the VIX of sectors. Are yeah. you still doing that work? Yeah, we did it for tech recently. Okay. And interesting. What did you find? Tech is not as volatile as it was historically relative to SP. It's like a tech VIX versus like the VIX of, of just the Why is that? Because these companies are now cash machines. Yes. Okay. They were seen as defensive at one point, uh, I think last year. They might, like, they might be again. People were saying like, like Apple, or, or as Apple, Apple and Amazon could be defensive stocks. You again. might have said is Apple safer than bonds. You might have said it. Yeah, I, I probably did say it. Apple, well, just look at their cash. How much of that market cap is bonds? I mean, Apple was the ultimate safe haven this year so far, right? And okay, so among among, all, among tech, among tech, yeah. so Apple's beaten. <laughs> look, Apple's, look at that run for Apple, hilarious. right? And that's the value growth rotation. The inverse of the value growth rotation. Unbelievable. That is that low is March fourteenth. It's not in the dock. Any thoughts on Berkshire being an absolute horse this year? I mean that that stock has been miraculous, yeah. even relative. By the way, to, you look at Berkshire, you don't even know that there's anything going on in the market. That's that's you look. You think bull market. What do, what is that about? They just have so much cash, and insurance premiums are inherently a good inflation. And haven't they been the biggest beneficiary of the value rotation? Yeah, and but. If you're thinking about like what's the safest thing, it's the Apple of non-tech stocks. And they own a ton of Apple. <laughs> and they own it. So you get both. Right. Um, we want to talk about crypto with you. You you were saying that you were the first guy on Wall Street to write about crypto, like as a strategist. Yeah. Okay. Where where were you writing about crypto at? Convergex. Okay. And bullish? Yeah. You were? Yeah. Why? It's a cool technology. When did you write about it first? Like 13? I want to say like August 2013. Holy shit. Okay. And I got the most random guys coming into my office after I started writing about it because I would get quoted about it. And I met people like, oh, I started mining this in 11 and 12. Like and the weirdest people. Dudes in- with like shorts and flip-flops would come into my <laughs> office. Like this was a button-down brokerage firm. Yeah. And just want to talk about what they were doing. And I just thought it had, it basically had one thing, distributed technology that wasn't hackable. And to this day, Bitcoin's never been hacked. You can hack an exchange. They haven't hacked the blockchain yet. Right, right. Okay. And that's, what is an unhackable technology worth? Are there any others? No. Uh, if man makes something, man can unmake it. Right. Other than this, how, they can, say, how the, can that the, be the, true? The code is, is too complex to, to hack. It's because you don't have, you like a 51% attack would be like the most logical way to go about it. And even then, you can't, figure out how to create a powerful enough algorithm to solve back to back to back. Google's quantum computing isn't a threat to uh, encrypt, in, encrypted uh, blockchains. I've always thought the way you know the first quantum computers lit up is because Bitcoin goes to zero. Okay, that's that's super bullish. <laughs> so that's how you'll know that quantum computing is real. Right. So do we think that they're wasting a trillion dollars on nothing or it is real? Quantum or Bitcoin? No, quantum. They're in a all right. They're in a lab right now. It's in their other bet segment. Nobody's asking for any ROI on this. Right. It's uh, minus forty degrees in the lab, so that the shit can work. This is like ones and zeros that can change into zeros and ones, or uh, halves or quarters or, or halves sixteenths. Or qu- okay. Or- all right. Forget about understanding the computing part. I never will. But 
if people are saying like this is the thing that could unmake blockchains because of how powerful and how quickly it can run calculations, shouldn't we pay should we pay attention to that or is it too far away to be worried? It seems to be too far away to be worried. He doesn't seem worried. Quantum is really? super. Yeah. The reason Google very complacent about quantum computing. The reason Google and Microsoft and everybody else is going after quantum is because you have to try. Because if there is an answer and you develop it, that's your next trillion dollars of market cap. What is the promise of quantum? Is it like we cure cancer by hitting enter, and it basically searches every piece of data we have and tells us the answer to it? It's just yet. Yeah, look, I mean, Moore's law has been running pretty much nonstop since 1965. Yeah, it's slowing down. We're getting to a physical limitation on how fast we're a chip in nano can run. now. We're, how, yeah. What what else can you do? We're getting to the point where atoms can jump circuits in a chip and create a, an error rate. So we need the next thing. Mm. Like even you know, I think I've been watching, following you on, on some social media, and you've been you know showing the Nasdaq returns after bear markets, mm. and that is all very valid. But Moore's law was running hot and heavy during all those periods. Yeah. So you can't, what, rely, you can't rely on that jump in productivity anymore. Right. So, yeah, when you double the power of something for the same dollar every two years for 50 years, you're going to get those kind of returns. I'm bearish again. I'm bearish so again. So quantum computing is almost defensive. Like, it's, it's not a luxury. If they don't figure this out, then what? Then eventually Moore's law slows down or stops and you're reliant. Look, and I think that's why, like, the metaverse is so important. Because if you're designing, if you're thinking about technology for the next 20 years, you can't be have Moore's Law as your backstop. You have to now think about how you create scarce commodities where you used to just basically throw everything out there for free. Okay. And the metaverse is ultimately like how do you lock up space in a virtual world that creates its own value and cash flows? How do you? By creating a metaverse where you say, okay. Like he's going to tell you. Yeah. I mean, at some basic level, it's like, okay, if you have a, a stadium where there's a, a show going to go on, you sell the concessionaire spots. Okay, so it's going to mimic the real world, how scarcity works, the metaverse. And it's just going to take 15, 20 years before mass acceptance that it's real. And you need and at the, least one or two more flips of Moore's Law to create the processing power to have VR actually be compliant. Well, that's what I was going to say, because when I saw Zuckerberg's announcement of the metaverse, it looked like Blue's Clues. It looked like a children's show. Yeah. that's Nobody's going to pay for that. Nope. Or hang out there. Nope. Uh, with him riding a cartoon skateboard, yeah. it's just not going to happen. Uh, all right, let's let's keep it moving. Would you get into a driverless Waymo? You believe as a, a everything that you know from the automotive industry and their capabilities and their hype machine. Like we know that they're running these things now in some cities, mostly cities with perfectly perpendicular grids, like. Glendale, Arizona, or whatever. That dirt doesn't rain, it doesn't snow. Yeah, so it would be a little bit more challenging outside of your office or mine. Yeah. Um, but what's what What should we think as shareholders of, let's say, Alphabet, which owns Waymo, or Tesla shareholders? Like, how real is autonomous vehicle? Real in terms of a five-year payback? How real in terms of, like, that's something that we're going to be doing? Like, I'm, I'm, I went out to a dinner, I had a bottle of wine, I probably shouldn't drive home. I also don't want to get involved with like an Uber. My car will f***ing drive me home and I'm good. Like, can I look forward to that in the next few years? No. Okay. That's very depressing to me. Why? They seem to, the, the auto companies seem to think that we can or they want us to believe that. And they thought so five years ago. Okay. So this is a very long promise. This is a much bigger challenge than anybody wants to admit is the bottom line. It is very Why? hard. Because of all the variables? Yes. Okay. And they also need to have the chips on the machine. You can't do this from the cloud because you can't react fast enough. The machine can't react there fast enough. There was a hope that 5G would allow you to do some distributed computing on this challenge. But 5G coverage is not very ubiquitous, and that's still a hard thing to do. So, yes, it would be much easier to have it all be native to the car, like all the chips and all the software running in the car. For the last four weeks, uh, outside my building on 57th Street in Manhattan, I have seen a Waymo van driving around collecting data. So there's some, but there's somebody in it. Yeah, they're it's here. A safety driver. They're literally no, they're literally here on the, the data collection mode. So all they're doing is having a dude drive around New York City all day long collecting data. Where does he stop? Where are the risks? You know, why did he stop when that blurry brown thing started to, you know, run in front of him? And so they're collecting the data and trying. New York is the hardest use case for self-driving, I think, in the US. 
because New Yorkers are such that if they see a self-driving car, they will step right in front of it. Oh, yeah. I <laughs> dare you to hit me. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. What are you going to do? That's, that's uh, uh, what's his name? John Voigt in the uh, pushing Dustin Hoffman in the wheelchair. Right? Yes. I'm walking here. Right? What was that? I never saw Ur- that movie. Is that uh, Urban, Urban Cowboy? Cowboy? You never saw that? No. Watch it. Midnight Cowboy. Uh, Midnight Cowboy. It doesn't. It's not that good. That's a great scene. Uh, all right. So that's what makes it so challenging is not the technology, but the environment. Yes. And the and we are a warlike people in New York. Yes. We almost want the confrontation so we could tell people that it happened. Hey, you get hit by a Google car, it's 10 million bucks in your pocket. Yeah. Arizona, they'll like wait on the curb for uh, a walk sign. Even in LA. Yeah. We don't do that shit. <laughs> people are always amazed when they see me do that. Uh, want, just wander across lanes of traffic. Um, and I'm always amazed that they're amazed. So- if you had to make a financial bet on Waymo, Cruise, or Tesla, understanding that they're buried within bigger companies, but who do you think like has an advantage or is it too soon to know? You know, if, I think GM has done a lot of good work. I think Cruise actually is pretty far along. How they monetize it, no idea. You know, how they get the value out, no idea. It's locked inside the company. Tesla is going to live and die on the next couple million EVs sold in this country, and they'll sell them, and, and that'll be fine. Um, as far as a technology that changes the world, mm. it's too far off. It doesn't exist yet. No. Okay. And it's too soon to know who might have it. Doesn't it, a company like NVIDIA and maybe AMD to a lesser extent win no matter what? Yes. Because GPUs are going to be so important to this? Yes, absolutely. So that's probably being reflected in these Pre- Particularly in a case where your Moore's Law is not working that well. So you need to, to make up for Moore's Law not, not running as fast, you have to specialize the chips. Specialized chips, higher margins. And you need nonlinear, ch- you need distributed uh, processing. That would be helpful. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, if Waymo called you and said, we want you to be part of a test, you're going to have the car take you to work every day for the next month and just observe, what you would, would you do it? Sure. You'd feel safe, to, just not in New York City. Actually, in New York, it's safer because you don't go that fast. Oh, uh, that's interesting. Um, Carnegie Mellon has a lot of these autonomous vehicles, yep. programs. And Pittsburgh is a horrible city to drive around yep. because it's all the bridges and, and it snows. rivers and, and it snows. And But if they're trying things out there, you're saying like theoretically New York should be easier because- Yeah, there's no highways. It's a grid and it's you driving slowly. Right. Okay. Uh, what, this Sean added this, search engine, search interest in electric cars versus price of gas. Yeah. Is, is there a signal in this? There must be, right? Yes. Yes, there is. There is. What do you do with this? This is maybe the one best shot. Like, okay, so EVs are really super interesting because they are a very different product from ICE vehicles, right? And so my existential question is, are we going to have 3 million Americans walk into car dealerships in 60 months' time and buy an EV? Because that is a big jump. If if oil is above 100, the answer is probably yes. Yes. What percentage of cars are EVs in the United States right now? Less than 10. As a percentage of the total fleet or sales? Uh, Whatever. So as a percentage of the total fleet, one. But new sales, are we, what what are we new sales? Are we at five yet? Yeah, I think we're at five. But up from zero a few years ago. Yes. Five percent? Yeah, the question is, but there's a lot more, it's it's capacity constraints. So there's a lot more coming. So the question is, are you going to get too many Americans to walk in and buy an EV? A hundred percent. Yeah. I don't know whose EV they'll buy. I really doubt it. Wait, well, why do you doubt it? You don't think so. I, I think f- I think f- four and a half dollars a gallon at the pump is enough. So I'm a car salesman and you walk in and you say, hey, I, I want to buy, you know, I'm thinking of buying an EV, but I'm here to check out your internal combustion vehicles. And I say, okay, so here's the thing. You're, uh, you get a, you, you just, you're out driving for the day on Sunday and uh, you're, you know, you go a lot further than you expect. And uh, you, so your car is down to like a 5% charge. You've got 30 miles left on the car. You plug it in, you go to sleep. One in the morning, your wife wakes up. She's super sick. you got to get her to the hospital right away. The hospital is 35 miles away. Car is not charged. Car is not charged. Are you seriously going to risk your family's life because you want a cool EV? Doesn't everybody have the charger in the garage, though? What if it's not fully charged? How Do you need a fully charged car to get to the hospital 10 miles away? Do you want to risk it? Well, what percentage of families are two, are two household cars? Because you could have one. All, all, anybody who works two jobs, yeah. which so, is basically all working so, households. So what if you get 50% of households to do that? What if you get, what if you get ha- ha- half the household? Right, that's so what I'm one car out that's of two. That works okay. But I'm saying that there's a very easy pushback to say, are we really going to have that faster transition? Okay, so another thing. Okay, you, you want to buy an EV. Cool. Um, what's your resale value going to be in five years? 
the battery is going to be maybe last seven. After five years, that battery is inter- integral to the car. Are you seriously thinking that car is going to be worth as much as the car I'm going to sell you as an ICE vehicle? Oh. I'm, I'm leasing. Okay. So if you're leasing, then I'm going to impute. Cadillac Lyric. Then I'm I going to lease a Lyric. Then I got to impute a 40% residual on a 36-month, 39-month yeah, I, acknowledge, month I acknowledge I'm not getting a good deal. I don't care. And so you're going to pay fifteen to $1,700 for a $100,000 car on a lease. Fine. You might. Most won't. Yeah. Okay. There's not a big market for that. Okay. Now, the other thing is the dealer networks, Ford and GM, mm. legacy dealer networks. Those guys don't want to sell electric cars. No, they don't. And there's very little service uh, contract value for doing that. There's a, a whole host of reasons that they don't want that. So you're going to have uh, humans standing in the way of this just based on their own incentives, right? Yeah, a, a lot of that. You know, The product will be excellent. I have no doubt. These products are going to be great. Can you move 2 million units a year? I okay. don't know. What about charging stations? Like, are they around? Do they exist around here? <sighs> You just hit like the most important topic. They're so hard to find. So my garage, I have a car in New York, and there's a, my garage has one charging station. One dock for everyone's <laughs> Tesla. Yeah. So alternatively, if you just got a lot more charging stations, and the U.S. is way behind on this. So if you can get a lot more charging stations running everywhere, parking lots on the street in New York, if you can get there, you got a much better shot. How long does it take to charge a car, even just so that you can get back on the road versus saying filling up a tank of gas? An hour. Oh, an hour? Half an hour. I mean, it really depends on what level of charge you've got. Volkswagen's got some technology that goes much faster. But so, that, but that's a huge- So I've heard the, the, the other way around, though. As 300-mile capacity starts to become industry standard, the lack of charging stations becomes less and less important because how many people are driving 300 miles in, in a day? It's very, very rare. Most people are driving five miles to drop the kid off at school or two miles to their job. Now, the average commute in the U.S. is roughly 35 minutes and roughly 25 miles each way. Okay, so you can, so you you're can going, go a week without charging your car. Well, You wouldn't, but you could. Right, you could. But this is a question mark. I get the math, but um, car buyers are very conservative people by and large because they're risking a lot of capital. There's, this is the second biggest purchase somebody makes in their life after their house. Mm. And they've got to do it every three or four years. And so they don't, they're pretty risk averse. Right. And so- They have to get that right. They have to get it right. You have to get it right on how much it costs you. You have to get it right on what's the out. Okay. So I'm not saying it's not going to happen, but to me, this is the one question that people aren't asking enough. Is, is demand going to be there? So we're all assuming if they build it, the demand is there, but it might not be that way. And the auto industry is got- 100 years of history of misjudging consumer demand. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, without a doubt. Absolutely. Absolutely.